Okay, good evening everybody. This is the College of Complex. Okay, so without much further ado, we will hear from Stan Smith. I'm in the Chicago Committee to Free the Cuban Five, and if you don't know about it, I'll hand out a card about the case of these political prisoners. I'm also part of the Latin America Solidarity Coalition, which is a national organization of groups working for the sovereignty of countries in Latin America. Speak into the microphone. Uh, oh. I was going to show those a little later. Okay, I'll I'll minimize it. Yeah, I'll I'll. I'll talk about that all the time. Where do you get a short waiver? Just speak into the mic. I was just down in um, the School of America's protest last weekend, talking about the Ecuador, Bolivia, Venezuela, and Cuba, which I couldn't really mm -hmm. do in an hour. Um, I chose. Uh, Bolivia and Ecuador, because people in this country know so little about what's going on in those two countries, and often there's a lot of misinformation among progressive groups about what's happening in those countries. Uh, Bolivia, if you know, Evo Morales is the president of Bolivia. He got elected in 2005. He's an indigenous leader of that country. I guess he's the second indigenous leader elected in Latin America after Benito Juarez, I believe. Is that right? You well, I don't know if he's Some really indigenous. indigenous. Um, before Evo Morales was elected, Bolivia was known as the country that had the most coups in Latin American history, which they had 190 coups between their independence and 2005. And, and during the 90s, in our, er, all the 90s in Latin America, up to the time of when well, Korea came into power in Ecuador in 2007. Before them, for previous 15, 20 years, they, had, they were privatizing everything in those countries, which greatly reduced the standard of living of the people. For example, when, he, when uh, Evo Morales came to power in, in Ecuador, most everything had to be privatized to foreign corporations, which in Latin America basically means U.S. corporations. And the extreme poverty in the countryside had reached 75% or three quarters of the people by 2002. Well, his election had basically changed the country. I guess before he came to power, the, the white elite ran the country and the indigenous or the original peoples down in a sort of like a apartheid system in that country. And since then, uh, it's been completely reversed. As the people up there said, uh, the colonizers have ruled our country for 500 years, and now we are back in power, and we're not going to give it up. Um, their economic growth in this country has been about 6.5%, which in the U.S. it's only like 2%. Over what period of time, Stan? Uh, going back since like 2005, 2006. Well, they've had over 6% growth every year. Now, it's not that they've had any kind of socialist revolution. All they have done is taken control of uh, the transnational corporations, unlike what we've done in our country. So they've, they've made corporations pay a higher tax rate. They've stopped them from ripping off all their um, natural resources. I don't know if you remember Cochabamba with the water war started yeah. in uh, Bolivia, which they drove out Dick Cheney's corporation. They took over the, um, they had to, he based, his corporation basically had to leave in the year 2000, and I guess it set an example for the struggle against the IMF and the World Bank protest here in the United States as well, I guess, as the Occupy movement. Uh, 
Uh, Equ uh, Bolivia has a lot of uh, gas, and one thing that Evo Morales did once he came into power was to nationalize the gas, which had been privatized. He also nationalized the telecommunications and the water and the electricity. So before he came into power, foreign corporations took 85% of the wealth from the gas out of the country. Now he's reversed it so that 80 between 80 and 90 percent of the wealth of, the, of their gas exports goes into social development of the people, which is an example of what we could do here if you look at how much these corporations keep ripping us off more and more every year and more and more. They get richer and richer and we're getting poorer and poorer. And actually I read something in the Huffington Post about how we subsidize corporations to the tune of almost a, a trillion dollars a year in different social, pro, uh, not social, pro, social programs for corporations. We even subsidize corporate jets to the tune of three billion dollars a year in this country. So if we did what countries like Ecuador and Bolivia did, they took this money back and they use it to, to improve the lives of the common people there. So now the national wealth is, is spent, a lot, a lot of it is spent on health and education, on increasing their wages of the people, on increasing their social security benefits, <laughs> their programs for the elderly and school children and pregnant mothers. They put price controls on staple foods so that the people can keep, um, it's always affordable. They built a lot of public works and uh, infrastructure. And in his first term in office, he created a, a half a million jobs, and this is a country that is nine, nine and a half million people. So in his first four years, he created half a million jobs, which a major pro social program, economic program, and you can see how many jobs did the Obama really create after 2008. It's really not much. But these are things that we can do in our country. They didn't have any real revolution to do it. It's just the government is just going to not be obedient to corporations. In their country, their poverty rate has declined by a quarter since he came into power 10 years ago. In our country, it's what? 35, 50 million people live in poverty, according to official government statistics, which is one out of every seven, and that's not including all the people who are not documented. In our country, we're cutting social, I mean, uh, food stamps. I think this year the Obama administration cut food stamps by $9 billion, but they found $40 billion for the wars in Iraq and Syria. But our system here is so um, skewed that Right now, there's 18 and a half million vacant homes in the United States, which is enough homes to give each homeless person six homes. Now, this kind of thing can go on in this country, and we tolerate it, but in, Equ in Ecuador and Bolivia, they've taken action to reverse this and force um, these corporations to start meeting people's needs. Hmm? Did you know what? Salt Lake City, Utah's doing? They're housing the homeless. Yeah. It's radical for that red state we're doing. They turn a homeless problem around by housing. One full at a time, man. Q&A comes after. Well, I guess I could, I could give you some. I made some statistics comparing the, the, man with the head. social economic changes in these uh, four countries, these ALBA countries, compared to the United States, I can hand out. Well, I think one of the most significant things going on in, in Bolivia when I was there, which I went on a political delegation to Bolivia in October. Ecuador, I just went on a regular tourist vacation, so my slides are going to be a lot different, even though a lot of the slides are not very fancy. Um, 
the most significant thing I saw in Bolivia is the amount of involvement in the people in their country building a new society. That everywhere there people are organizing to try to change things and to uh, improve their communities. And they've done things like uh, eliminated illiteracy in that country. In fact, in both of these countries they've eliminated illiteracy. And Bolivia is the third poorest country in, in Latin America. So you think if a country like Bolivia can, what I say, it's raised its minimum wage 88%, I, say, I think, since 2005. Well, the minimum wage in our country has gone down by one-third since 1974. And that's the third poorest country in the world, I mean in Latin America, that can do th something like that. And we're basically the richest country in the world, but our, we have let our minimum wage drop by a third. It's not because there's no money. The government has also done things with both of these countries. They've done, taken action that have instituted a more progressive income tax so that the the income uh, difference between the top top 10 percent and the bottom 10 percent in Bolivia has been cut in half while in our country I don't know if you've read statistics about it but I think the hundred richest people now have more wealth than 50 percent of the US population just sort of giving us our country an income distribution like existed in feudal Europe a thousand years ago. Because unfortunately people here are not really like mad about it and doing anything. In uh, Bolivia they have been fighting for a long time and they've made many advances. And a lot of these advances are still, you can't really say, well, this is a, it's not a socialist country yet it's still operating in the capitalist system. They just have a much more, I guess, social democratic kind of government. Some other things I could say about uh, Bolivia that the U.S. tried to have a coup against Evo Morales in 2008. And, uh, that's when Evo Morales kicked out the U.S. ambassador. By 2000 and Seven, or since 2007, they've uh, educated 800,000 Bolivians, which population of nine and a half million, makes them the, so they can be able to read and write. The government has taken one third of the country, of the land in the country and distributed to the uh, original people's peasant communities to run communally, and they've taken this land away from the government lands and, and large estates and forest lands and they turn it over to the people and the communities to run. Last year they kicked out USAID, if you know that, the US Agency of International Development, which is notorious for trying to fund groups that are trying to overthrow progressive governments in Latin America, Bolivia, Ecuador, Venezuela, Cuba. When uh, Evo Morales was asked about relations with the U.S. a little while ago, he, he said, I have no regrets. In fact, I am pleased to have expelled the U.S. ambassador, the Drug Enforce the Enforcement Agency, the DEA, and to have closed the U.S. military base in Bolivia. Now, without any U.S. ambassador, there is less conspiracy and more political stability and social stability. And without the International Monetary Fund, we are better off economically. He's also made some statements about uh, immigrant rights, where he said, um, he said this recently, we want to say to the countries of Europe and to the world, especially Europe, to the governments, just as Europeans and Spaniards arrived in Bolivia and our grandparents never said they were illegal, Today, the Latin Americans that come to Europe cannot be declared illegals. <laughs> he said other things that are very 
anti-capitalist. Like, I'm convinced that capitalism is the worst enemy of humanity in the environment and is the enemy of the entire planet. He said that democracy and politics need a new foundation. This was once when he was meeting with the Pope, I think, in uh, October. Democracy and politics need a new foundation, since democracy is government by the people and not by capital and the bankers. He emphasized the fact that, quote, Mother Earth must be respected and that we must oppose the notion of privatizing basic resources. And he suggested that popular movements mm -hmm. should organize a great alliance of the excluded in, in order to defend the collective rights. As you might know, I think that Bolivia had a big conference, environmental um, conference on global warming back, I think, in 2008 in Cochabamba. So I feel that Bolivia has been involved a lot in trying to take action against global warming. But it's rather hard when most of it is occurring, coming from the countries in Europe and the United States. In fact, I read something that it said only 80, 80 corporations in the world are responsible for two-thirds of the hydrocarbons produced causing global warming. I was basically saying probably maybe 250 people in the world are responsible for the continuing inaction on global warming, which is threatening the whole, all the species on the Earth. The U.S. military is the biggest polluter in the world. Yeah. The U.S. defense. I was, uh, the election in Bolivia was uh, October 12th, and we were outside the presidential palace when he gave his speech. He deliberately had the election that day because, you know, the day that is Columbus Day. <laughs> it's like an anti-Columbus Day. What? What's your agenda day? Uh, he, uh, he dedicated it, he won the election with 60% uh, of the vote, and it's, uh, it's his third election. I think his first election he got like 55%, and then 64%, and this time 61%. He dedicated his victory to all the people in the world that are fighting against corporations and, ne and neoliberalism and for national liberation and for all people struggling against U.S. imperialism. He just comes out and talks like that in his speech. And he dedicated his victory to Fidel Castro and Hugo Chavez. It's rather interesting to have a, meet a leader like that. That's, plus, uh, we were not even as far away from him as the end of this restaurant. Just on one side of, well, I guess it's like the streets here. We were on the other side of the street, and he was on this side of the street in the balcony speaking to the crowd there. And he was, all the people surrounding him were all hard hat workers. <laughs> it was rather interesting. Another thing that I noticed, well, I couldn't get any pictures that came out. Um, Go to the pictures now? No. Okay. Um, now, all the people are. You can turn on the television, you know, if you watch, in, I guess, Spanish news in the U.S. or Mexican news channels, you basically see uh, white Latinos. But in, <laughs> now in Bolivia, I was watching some talking head show, and they had one of the women with the bowler hats, and the, she was sitting there discussing the uh, elections with some other people. As they said, now they can turn on the TV and see people who look like them, and they can go into their Congress and see people who look like them. And before, 10 years ago, all they would see there would be white people. So this is a country that's really going under a basic, profound change, slowly. It's going on for 10 years, and it's not going to stop. And I would think sooner or later the U.S. is going to hear more hostile stuff about Bolivia as the U.S. gets more worried about that country. Uh, you're at 6. You can go to 7.30. It's right now 6.
59 here at 7 o'clock oh, right now. Okay, okay let's get to Correa. Um, Rafael Correa is the president of Ecuador. He was elected in, I think, 2007, right? Um, before him, Correa, uh, Ecuador had seven presidents in 10 years. <laughs> I think now he has one of the highest public approval ratings in Latin America. He was just re-elected re in 2013. I, I forget, like 57% of the vote, maybe a little more. Um, yeah, 57%. And he won two-thirds of the majority in the parliament, just like uh, Evo Morales did. One thing both of these presidents did when they got elected was like in uh, what... Um, Hugo Chavez did in, in uh, Venezuela is to have the people create a constitutional assembly and rewrite the constitution and have a new popular constitution that the people want. And if you know much about Latin America these days, when the government of uh, Honduras was overthrown, that's because they were going to have a, uh, a vote on whether to make a new constitution. A big, pro a big issue here that everybody should know about is the problem that um, Ecuador, Ecuador has with the Chevron, which had a huge oil spill. They just left it in the Amazon that was bigger than what happened in the Gulf of Mexico with uh, British Petroleum. And then uh, Chevron got taken to court and they were told to pay $9.5 billion to help clean it up, and they've refused to pay. I can find out some information about the campaign, about what... Two different things. Okay, any... any uh, they just left it there. They've uh, ruined the home, the, the habitat where 30,000 people used to live, and, and they're not doing anything to clean it up. And even though I think Chevron's profits are $22 billion a year, they're refusing to pay any of this $9.5 billion to clean up the Amazon. One of the things that um, Ecuador has emphasized since Rafael Correa was elected was to have some uh, educational revolution in that country. Just like in, also in Bolivia, they've been building free universities for these original peoples who lived in that country who never had any access to college education anywhere. They're having free public universities for people in, uh, in those places that have never had any university. So not, now uh, Ecuador is second to Venezuela with the number of <coughs> college students coming from uh, families that are living in poverty. So that, that country invests twice as what the United States does in education. And they even provide a lot of scholarships for students to go study overseas and pay for them so it's free. It's unlike in this country, and you know, the college student debt now is now $1.2 trillion. Countries in, in Bolivia, Venezuela, Ecuador, and Cuba, college education is free. So you wouldn't have to, it's all free. Just like healthcare in these countries is all free. You think about how much we pay on health care and education. <coughs> and you wonder, well, why these poor countries can have free health care and free education through college and the richest place in the world cannot. It's, it's outrageous. Their economy over the last seven years under Korea has grown about 4% a year. They've also taken Korea has also taken action against the neoliberal policies and the IMF policies that were imposed on that country before. They've taxed the rich a lot more. 
they've cut out a lot of ways that corporations get out of paying taxes. Like, example in this country might be General Electric. I, I think General Electric plays, pays no taxes in this country. So you can imagine how much money that would amount up to a couple of years. And in countries like Ecuador, that kind of situation would have, was much worse before Correa came into power. And he's also a grad of Champaign-Urbana, I think. Yeah. Um, their minimum wage in Ecuador has doubled in the last seven years. They actually have a living wage policy established in that country that corporations can only pay dividends on shares to their shareholders when all their workers receive a living wage. Wow. <laughs> Which would be some, yes, that would be something. Yeah, I read these things. And that why can a, a poor country like this do stuff like that in the U.S.? No. Why people in this country not angry about what's happening and really fighting mad about it? Um, extreme poverty in that country has been cut in half, I think. Yes. Um, and they've cut income inequality in half almost. They're all homemade. <coughs> now in Ecuador, 23% of the country is a national park. Actually, Ecuador, if you, well, I don't have, most of the pictures I had was my family was in them, so I had to cut down on how many pictures I could show of Ecuador. But if you want to go to a, a really beautiful country, Ecuador, that's not expensive, in fact, it uses U.S. dollars as their currency. That'd be a great country to go to. When, I, when we were on the tour, they said 56% of the mammal species in the world live in Ecuador because it goes from way up on the top of the Andes down to the Pacific Ocean and then the top of the Andes down to the Amazon. So it has uh, various ecosystems all over the country. Uh, Ecuador has also shut the U.S. military base in Manta. And Rafael Correa said, if the U.S. lets us build a base in Miami, you can keep your base in Manta. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Miami needs a, they need a military base there from Latin American governments to watch all these uh, Latin American gangsters and generals who are there. The Korea is also famous for uh, giving uh, asylum to uh, Julian Lassange. He was also, uh, Ecuador was the only country that refused to uh, vote to re-include Honduras in the, in the OAS after the coup in Honduras. Well, I guess I can show pictures now before I run out of too much time. This is, oh. Uh, I don't have my pictures aren't any fancier. Than no, no, I clothes. just may have lost them. Lost them? Uh, I just accidentally closed them. They were on. Okay, that was the picture show. Uh, my fault. Uh, what, what's it? Uh, oh. the drive? USB disk? Yeah, it's right here. So I think this is it right here. Yes. There, right? Oh, that was, uh, this is a... Okay. Radio, radio station started with the help of Cuba and uh, Venezuela in uh, Bolivia. It was called Radio, Radio Coca and Death to the Yankees. Ah. <laughs> That's the name of the station. Now, Eva Morales was the leader of the Coca workers movement. And 
um, they've been fighting against the U.S. trying to do all this fumigation for years and years and years. So it's been a militant movement by the cocoa workers in that country to keep growing cocoa because they use it for their own things. Next one. Yeah. And this is, uh, well, you know, Hugo Chavez, I guess. This is a man, he's uh, from Bolivia. He's, if he got killed in about 1790s, I think, when he tried to overthrow the Spanish. And he was the one who said, um, I shall return his millions. I think, have you heard of that? You know, when you land in America, yeah. there's... Simon Bolivar? No, it's, it's Atari. Oh, he said that basically, you can kill me, but I will return his millions. Yeah. And he's now a national of that. Bolivia now has a satellite called the Tupac Kamari satellite. He looks good. And uh, they see Ava Morales as the new Tupac Kamari. Katari. Okay. Not next. Jacob this is one of the universities they just built in the last couple of years for in uh, this uh, indigenous or original peoples area for the Aymara, the Quechua, Indian peoples, only for students whose parents had never gone to college. <laughs> That's a requirement, and they they get educated, and uh, one of their they're expected to go back in their communities and use their knowledge to help improve the life of the people in their community. But all, everything I was provided for free. Are they referred to as Indians there? No, I don't you know. Sometimes they say indigenous, but a lot of times they say original peoples. Because indigenous seems kind of patronizing. Very much. Because my grandmother was native-born English woman, and I think if I said, oh, you're an indigenous English, I think she would be greatly insulted <laughs> <laughs> can't say white people are indigenous even in Europe, but so if you can't say it for us, then they say original peoples. Okay. Canada says first peoples. Oh, first peoples? Yeah. Oh, this is part of the uh, school, the name of the school there, <coughs> named after an indigenous leader. Okay, next one. I guess that's built with the help of uh, Venezuela. Okay. This is a director of the school. Oops, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. This was our tour guide. He doesn't, I mean, he was the president of the school. Doesn't really look like it, but he's, I mean, he's not dressed up like a U.S. president of the school. Oh, that, I can't really see that too well, but that says, Katari, that's the guy I told you about, that said we will return his millions. And that's Abel Morales. He says the, rev the rebellion and the revolution. And so they see continuity between the two. <laughs> okay. This is some of the, the computers in the classroom and so on. All this stuff they provide for free for everybody. Not like here in our poor third world conditions where we have to buy all our own stuff. <laughs> Next one. Yeah. Yeah, that's the name of the school there. Well, they say indigenous there. Okay. Sorry. That's more of the school. Uh, this was, uh, this woman used to be the Minister of Justice in Bolivia for a couple of years. Like they have t two justice systems, one for the traditional European style justice system and one the indigenous injustice system that is depending on the, if it's a major crime it goes to like murder it goes to um, the European style justice system but any other kind of uh, thing it's, it goes through this community justice system run by the people in, in, the, in those communities and she's the she used to be the minister in fact in both of these countries I think in uh, in Bolivia, by law, half the elected officials have to be women. In Ecuador, I think 48% of them are. 
Or maybe half. I'm not sure. This was a Cuban hospital that was we went to in, in Bolivia. For a few years, 80% of the doctors in Bolivia were Cuban doctors. No, I don't know. Now, you know, Cuba and um, Venezuela both have this international school of medicine that provide heat free, trained people to be doctors, and they get thousands of them from Ecuador and Bolivia and other countries. I forget how many thousand they Cubans and, and Venezuela have trained now. Can I ask a very quick question? So, um, uh, no. it says, like, let's say, integral medicine. Uh, they talking about like the, uh, medicine of integral, like because I. Yeah, uh, this is regular hot Oh, it's just name, right? Integral name, right? It means. Like that. I guess so. I don't know. These are the Cuban doctors in the hospital. Seems like Cuban doctors always look like that, right? Every time they see them, they look so easy to tell. This, there's two, two Cuban doctors. This is a Bolivian guy who was in Chile at the time of the coup against Allende. And he was some activist. And he was in the stadium where Allende had rounded up all the like leftists. He knows it. He knows it. Yeah. Allende was a good guy. Ah! Oh, yeah. <laughs> Pinochet rounded up everybody and what you know. And it, either killed him or whatever happened. He said he was one of the last people to spend time with uh, Victor Hara, if you know him, the famous Chilean uh, singer who was executed in the stadium. Yeah, I'm not sure. Victor Hara, I think, before they killed him, they smashed all his fingers or cut off his fingers. This is some of the countryside in Bolivia. Bolivia is very, very dry. And it's very, very high. Um, in La Paz is like 15,000 feet. And one way you can survive it is by taking coca tea or chewing coca leaves all the time. Which is everywhere. It's cheap. My running condo. These are some of the community leaders in this area, the women's organizations in this province. And they were talking about the work they do in their province to educate women and involve them in social life and to defend their rights as women and to make sure they get good education and know about all the social programs available for them. And they said, um, well, they, they, speak in Spanish they, language. they were speaking in Spanish, but our translator said that she was from Dominican Republic. She was part of our tour. She said some of their Spanish was pretty hard to understand because the word order was not right. So I guess it's definitely their second language. This was this um, Tupac Katari's wife who was. Her name is now, um, she was tortured to death by the Spanish because she, she wouldn't say where her husband was. Um, now the National Women's Organization in, in Bolivia is named after her. This was another leader who was in the government. <laughs> Women's leader, I forget what she was in. Um, she was in uh, Eva Morales' cabinet for a while. I guess, I mean, that's how they dress. That's how they... Better interesting as, you know, cabinet official. She invited us to her house and she made us quinoa. Uh, this is just some look at the streets in the city. This is... Yeah. This is right outside the presidential palace when Evo Morales was making his victory speech. This is some of La Paz. It sort of like, it looks like um, Caracas, like that. Yeah, it does. It's more La Paz. I think I'm in a cable car. Now they're, you know, they, they, 
place like that, you cannot build subways. So they're building what they call subway in the sky. So they're building cable cars going up. They're building uh, eight different cable car systems. So far they built two, and they, no, three. They're planning on more, and you get, a, you get a free dessert if you know what that is. Who do you think lives there? Who works there? It's the U.S. Embassy. Embassy. <laughs> 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 it's all by the fences. Yeah. And this is some of the cable car. The fen yeah, they have pipes. Yes. Go back to the. No. Go back to the embassy. <laughs> Which one, Mar? Prison right, right, right up here. It's windows. Right now, right there. And that's where the U.S. Awesome ambassador jumped. The the windows. I don't see anything that you're looking at. I don't even see it. It's for shooting arrows out at the peasants. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it looks sort of like Cook County Jail, right? It does look like a prison. I like the way they... That's yeah. exactly yeah, it's like right. It's more than Cook County Jail. Alright. We have to keep it in that's their, new, their cable cars. La Paz is like a bowl, and then on top of the bowl, there's this huge other city of like a million people. So they need the cable cars to go from the bottom of La Paz up to the, the top of the bowl. What about volcanoes? Active volcanoes? Well, I saw someone in, in, uh, in, Quito. in Ecuador. Oh, that word, this is, yeah, this is Bolivia. This is um, coca. It's coca leaves, and coca candy, coca wine, which tasted pretty nasty. <laughs> coca crackers. It has more coca candy. So they use coca a lot. They chew it a lot. Everything but snort it. Oh, yeah, they got to make a difference. Uh, this is one uh, little factory that the government in, uh, in Bolivia built that makes, um, I think it was, Licorice. they made four little factories to help meet the, the feed uh, pregnant mothers and mothers with babies and school children. I think this one was uh, making uh, juice. I forget. <laughs> That's coca in the wild, in their backyard, their garden. This one they have um, water. I forget what this is called. Sugar cane? No, it's not sugar cane. This is uh, some kind of yogurt they make in one of the factories. Some of the money that they take in from all their taking back their oil, their gasoline wealth, is that they built these factories in neighborhoods, little factories that provide for the needs of the poor women and children in school. This is special milk for pregnant mothers and breastfeeding mothers. It's all free. I think this is part of the old, uh, it was in that, <coughs> University, I showed you the old system that the uh, Incas used for uh, writing with their knots and the quipu. Yeah. They explained it all. Oh, this is really. This is we saw that one. Yeah. Oh, this is a, the hospital that where the Cuban doctors were. There's some more. Oh, this is a. Plaza in Cochabamba, where they had the square, where they had the water wars. You've seen that movie, Even the Rain. You know about that at all? No. Oh, well, even you know, the uh, Bechtel Corporation was there, and they got control of the rights to the water in that area. Uh -huh. And I don't know the whole story, but they even like you to pay a tax to their company if you collected rainwater. Uh -huh. oh. Yeah. yeah, medical care is free and for everybody yeah. in That's both countries. Uh, so I, I think every night this guy goes out there here and he gives some uh, political educational talk. 
about you know the origin of the struggle that and the, the water wars and how it led to the there's also gas wars after that and then Abel Morales got elected and he's been talking about what's going on in Bolivia since then so he just has a discussion with the community about educating them about the history in, in Bolivia and how they fit in. Sort of a Bolivian college of complexes, huh? Yeah, he's like, uh, what do they call those? Okay. Soapbox speakers. Yeah. Okay. Is the audience listening to him that night? No, okay, I guess that's for Bolivia. Okay. And there's fewer on Ecuador. So. How is university? The university is free. Is Bolivia or is that both? Okay, now, now I'm not sure. Those new folder. New folder. The new folder. Yeah. So this is uh, Quito from the mountains. Looking down on Quito. It looks a little bit like La Paz, but it's a lot greener. And Ecuador is a lot richer than Bolivia. It's not as high. No, it's not as high. No. Depends on who you talk to, though. <laughs> <laughs> I said it. Yeah, it's not as high. I don't. You couldn't get. You couldn't get high chewing coca leaves, though. It, it right. must do something for them. Well, it makes a uh, yeah. I chew. It makes. It's like drinking a lot of coffee. You don't. You don't get uh, low on energy. And you don't get hungry. You just keep going all day. You could run in a marathon. Okay. Here's some more of Quito. This is downtown Quito. <laughs> they don't really, I think they dressed up like us. This is traditional clothes of the people. They put on a little uh, show for us. Now, is this the country where you took a tour? Yeah, this was a tour. Yeah, this is for the show for the tourists in Ecuador out in the country. So it's much English in those those countries. You speak much English? They understand English. No. This is a hot springs place they went to. Like, what's a hot springs here? What do they call them? Arkansas, Arkansas. Where do they have hot springs? In Arkansas. 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 Oh. Palm Springs. Palm Springs. Yeah. Palm Springs. yeah. They have a lot of hot springs one place. You go and chill out in hot springs. That's in the Amazon. This is the Amazon? Yeah, we were out in the edge of the Amazon there. They were uh, just making one, a little hat, showing us how to make a hat from the palm. But I was talking to that woman about, um, well, so I didn't really have much time to have political discussions with people. I just asked her, well, how was it like in, Equ in Ecuador now under Rafael Correa? And she said, it's 180, degree dif 180 degrees different from what it was before, <laughs> which I guess here we say 360, right? No, 360, you end up on the same spot. Oh, okay. 180 is the other side. She said everything is much, much, much better. She's right. And she's, I guess she went to college for free, and now she's got a job as a naturalist or something. <laughs> the next? Yeah. That's a uh, volcano. Salt Street? Going by and see. Maybe it's volcano. better than making a... Uh, it's just coming out. I think I only got one. That's after a little while. But it just started when we were driving by, and then it's got... This is a sign I saw in downtown Quito. <laughs> Her street sign it says women dedicate 20 hours, 28 hours, more hours per week than men and domestic work that is not, not unpaid domestic work. 28 hours more a week than men. That's a street sign in Quito. It's not bad street sign, huh? That's a Makito right there. Yeah, you can get your exercise. At least you can walk. If you went to La Paz and tried to walk, you wouldn't be able to do it. Not at 
This is a woman I saw in the downtown square in Kiso. Chavez lives, the struggle continues. That's Hugo Chavez and Maduro. Okay. Um, the new president. It's Maduro's person. Can you call her? I don't know. Is that about it? Oh, this is a Guayasamin Museum. If you've heard of Guayasamin, the the, the painter. That was a very good. If you ever go to Quito, you should go to that museum. All right. Hmm? Is it an abstract painting? No, not really. This is his name there, Guayasamin. This is some quote from him there. Yeah, that's at the end of it. Okay. I'm going to shut your computer down now because you're starting to run low on power. Well, I might be done. It's all done, or right? I think. <laughs> Uh, <coughs> oh, this is some other lake we stayed at in, in Ecuador. There's more hot springs. I guess there's like three more. This is Amazon. That's where they make selling flower. Uh, they were growing roses and exporting them. And now they sell roses for 12 roses for a dollar. <laughs> Remember that next time you buy roses. <laughs> That's what they sell them for to the U.S. market, to the guys you buy them from, 12 a dozen for a dollar. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, is that it? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, so, okay. so yeah, questions? to just sum up, I think what I was most impressed by those two countries is how much they have used their natural resources, their their national wealth to meet the needs of their people and how much has changed in the last 10 years in those two countries. And what an example it shows for what we could do here if we got more organized. Venezuela, yes. What's the price of gas there? Oh, yeah. They just raised the price. Oh, they're going to raise it. I think it's like a couple well, cents. I, I, it was one I know penny. you all got a quite. I one know you have last I heard. Per liter. Per one liter. Penny. Per liter. Yeah. Oh, per liter. That's it. All right. So we are over the questions. Yeah, How many people here have questions? Mm -hmm. uh, are you done? No, you don't. Well, all right. We'll start with Ileana. Okay, let me fix this one first. I'll be back with change. Where's that? Back with change. All right, Ileana. No, no, I don't want. So listen, my question is, if it's really, because I'm absolutely from different planet, I'm from Russia. Louder. I can hear you. So my question is, if any native Indians, like here in America, like Mexico, Native Indians in those two countries, like Indians, you know, Indians people, like Mexican people, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, wait, uh, Maya or... Uh, no, no, no Maya. Or Quechua, Aymara. But they also like Indian, like Native Indian? Yes. Like from this country? Yeah, yeah. From this country? No, they're from their country. <laughs> what do you mean by that? But they call, but they call I mean, Native the Indians also, right? Uh, let's start the question yes. over. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh well, it might. All right. Go to Sikoa. I wonder what American corporations or foreign corporations and. Do they take some of the profit away from these corporations and not let them exploit like they used to? How many do they and what corporations are there? In, uh... um, I don't know. Um, well, in Bolivia they nationalized the gas. So I guess you I don't know what extent. Gas? <laughs> yes. Natural gas. Right. In Ecuador, I don't know the names of the corporations in Ecuador, but I know they've. Uh, what did I? I was reading numbers from uh, Bolivia. I think before Evo Morales came to power, the corporations took out 85 percent of the profits, and he changed it so now they take out 15 percent. Fifteen. Fifteen. 
and the rest of that 85 goes to the country for health and education and infrastructure and social benefits. Yes. Dan, you mentioned you mentioned that Ecuador, I think you said, was the only country that voted against Honduras's re-entry into the OAS. What happened to Venezuela and Bolivia? And they I can't answer that. The other ones voted to say, yeah, you can re-enter. After they had an election in, in, um, in Honduras, then they said, okay, you can go back in. But uh, Ecuador was the only one that said no. The same one the last time the OAS met, and they, Ecuador said, well, if Cuba is not an you know, organization of American states, if Cuba is not included in the, in the meeting of the organization of American states, when they met in Colombia, they said, we're not going, we're boycotting it. And uh, Ecuador refused to participate. And so now I think next time they do that, they're going to have to let Cuba go. The U.S. will. Of course, probably they'll just postpone forever the next meeting of the OAS. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's next year. They announced. I you, think they I'm announced. I'm sorry, I forgot. Jerry Pemigrass. Jerry Pemigrass. Oh, okay. In Bolivia. This is in response to news I heard and read about oh five, six years ago, maybe even more. Uh, it was during, uh, I think it was during Morales' second term or late in his first term, right, that there was a movement, there was a separatist movement there. Okay, are, it's kind of two parts. Are there real regional rivalries in Bolivia? And what kind of support does the separatist movement have, if any real support? What About what? Yeah, that was in the city of Santa Cruz. That area wanted to separate. That was basically where all the rich people live, the white, richer people. Okay, so you answer my next question. And that, that was in 2008, and that's when they, you, Evo Morales kicked out the U.S. ambassador because he was heavily involved in organizing it. Really? Yeah. <laughs> well, that was it right to your, oh, in the last election, Evo uh, Morales won 50% of the vote in that city. Okay. So I kind of, okay. and there were like three, three candidates, so. Okay. Yes, I have um, two questions. I can remember what one of them was. Uh, one of the questions is, uh, to what extent is Che Guevara still honored in Bolivia since he died there in 1967? Oh yeah, I was there, I didn't take a picture of the sign. They had a big, huge banner on the main street in La Paz because it was commemorating the 47th anniversary of his death, yeah, which was October 7th, okay. was it? I forget what day in October, 9th, 7th. 7th or 8th, something like that. What year did he get killed? 67. What day, I mean? Oh. Eight. Oh. And they do say that, you know, we're, uh, they did say in some meetings we were, that we're continuing the revolution that started, that goes back to Che Guevara back here in 1967. This is a continuation of that struggle. And the other question is, when they kicked the U.S. ambassador out, did they also break relations with us, or did they, or is the embassy still functioning there? Yeah, they still have an embassy, just no ambassador. Okay. Bolivia and, uh, doesn't have any ambassador here either. Okay. Yes. Okay. Oh, Frank Wally. Did you have a chance to observe in either country what the housing arrangements are? Like, is there more co-housing or communal housing arrangements as opposed to housing that focuses on nuclear families only? No, I don't, I didn't. But I would think in the original people communities or indigenous communities, nuclear family is not, well, not even if you go like in my 
Mexicans in the United States kind of define their families much different than I as a white American did. Mine is just was just my family and theirs is big cousins and everything. Yeah. That's the gentleman in the back here. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, just recently in July, I think, uh, well, President Morales was part of the meetings, parallel to the BRICS meetings, this new arrangement for economic development. And I know they had the whole Latin American network of nations meeting as well. And coming out of that, uh, Bolivia signed, nu signed nuclear deals, rail deals. Uh, we have the new Nicaraguan Canal being, you know, pushed. Are there any kind of developments like that uh, beginning to get uh, some real traction in the country? In, in Bolivia? Bolivia or in spinoffs into the uh, Ecuador. Well, Ecuador is a mo mo lot more developed than Bolivia. Right. Yeah. But I mean, this RICS arrangement that's now putting out hundreds of billions of dollars into these infrastructure projects in Latin America, in Mexico, I mean, uh, in uh, Africa, especially in, in China. China itself has offered the United States collaboration with doing that and got rejected by Obama and the administration again here just the, uh, at the uh, Asian meetings. So my question is, these dynamics, this new economic system that's basically taking or can take the place of the speculation being run by Wall Street in London, uh, <coughs> this new Nicaraguan Canal is really not known pretty much in the United States that it's even being started, or the new Suez Canal, that it's not completed, right? These kind of blackouts in the United States. Yeah, I don't know if that's finally been approved yet in, in Nicar oh, yeah. Nicaragua. Yeah, it's supposed to start on the December the 22nd. Oh. I don't know, really know about that, what you were talking about with the bricks in, um, in Bolivia. Well, but I did read that the industrialization there has increased dramatically since Evo Morales was elected compared to previous administrations going back for, I don't know, 30 years. But in fact, he's actually shifted away from an anti-nuclear program to a pro-nuclear program to an anti-drug program where he was pretty much, you know, parallel in some of his legalization being pushed out of the United States. So that shift is really... I'm not sure what you mean by that. I know they're trying to build some nuclear power plant, I think. Well, Brazil, Russia, the BRICS, it stands for Brazil, yeah. Russia, India. But about China. the drug program also. Right, well, if they're having these development programs, like with the Nicaraguan Canal, you can't have a, a, a youth force that is incapable of doing anything. So with the added dimension now of development, they're beginning to take seriously the fact that they've got to stop this legalization push and come back to a real program committed to growth. So the the overall parameters that are shifting when they're looking at a positive orientation, our task is really to get the United States to come back to its own principles and join some. Not bashing Russia and China and all these things that are going on. Save that for the Anyway. Okay. Okay, let's... Uh, it's been uh, maybe a year, 18 months ago since I heard anything else about this, but it seemed like to me I was reading about a controversy in Bolivia where the Morales government wanted to build a major highway from north to south, and there were some indigenous groups opposed to that, I think. Mm -hmm. Do you know anything about what's going on with that issue? Yeah. Yeah, I read a lot about it. A lot of, uh, the highway existed even before Morales said he was going to build it. It exists as a road. They were going to pave it. That's what they were going to do, not build a road, because we went on the road, and they said, this is the road that was a controversial road, and it's paved up to here, and then it stops. But it exists. Is that known so, as Highway 1? Is that what? known as Highway 1? <laughs> But I think there were protests against uh, building that, uh, or paving it, I guess, whatever you want to call it. And there were some indigenous groups that were uh, against it. And I, when I, I read about it, and they had a, a march to protest it. And then that march, the, before the march started off, the leaders of the march were calling the U.S. Embassy to coordinate 
what they were doing. Uh -oh. So, <laughs> ah, um, it's rather suspicious. And a lot of them are taking money from, and you know, there's U.S.-based environmental groups down there that get money from USAID and World wow. Bank that are pushing this conflict. It's like Abel Morales is oppressing the um, indigenous and destroying the environment. So what's really the truth about it? I mean, when the U.S. is in there doing that, it kind of makes it another issue of, well, U.S. got to get the U.S. out of this to see what the real issues are. Right now, I think the government's decided to postpone it. They had um, votes in the different communities, like 45 communities, and most of them voted to build it. Just like, well, if you go on roads in some of these back roads in these third world countries, you don't want to go on them. They're awful. <laughs> So someone says, office. yeah, we want to pave this, it's like a major advance. Is that the Pan American Highway or not? Uh, no, I don't think so. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. You're right. Is that mm -hmm. So many new people. You were in uh, Bolivia, that was a political trip? Yes. Did you come across people who realized the man who, who Murdered Chavez, or murder, murdered Che Guevara was implicated <coughs> in the coup. Did you come across oh, that, that information? In, implicated in what coup? The, well, the attempted coup. Remember the few, one guy was assassinated as hotel room, the Irish guy, when they tried to have a, a murder plot for Morales on that boat ride? You mentioned something to that effect earlier. There was a coup against them in 2008. Yeah. The guy who killed Guevara was implicated in that somehow. He oh, was older. Felix he was Rodriguez. Was but he was implicated. Did you come across anybody who talked about that or knew about it? No. All right. No, I didn't really ask. Thank you, Pedro. Go ahead. What's the status of the Chevron case? Right now, uh, Chevron is trying to prosecute the lawyer who's defending the people who are want their money. Chevron is going after everybody who is trying to go after Chevron. <laughs> and they have much more money to destroy them, and that's they're out to destroy them. He's a young indigenous guy, isn't he? Well, no, I think there's some American lawyer who lives in New York, and Chevron has a, a suit against them for libel, which, you know, you don't really have to prove anything is just that you have so much money you can just totally bankrupt this guy whether you have a case or not because you're Chevron and that's what they're doing. There was a good documentary about that whole oh. incident. All right. The, uh, yes, um, Ferdinand. Uh, uh, this is just a, a comment. Uh, you forgot to mention the kidnapping of uh, Morales during the height of uh, Snowden's uh, saga. I think this is a very significant development because I think this is the first time that they have kidnapped a sovereign leader of a country. Oh, when he was going to Europe? When he was coming back from Russia to going back to his country. Yeah, when the U.S. helped force down his plane. Yeah, I think, I think um, Evo Morales went to the U.N. and just say there should be a, a trial for um, against Obama for crimes against humanity. I don't know what happened with that. But yeah, forcing down a plane of another head of state. They also, when the U.S. didn't, wouldn't let uh, Nicolas Maduro, the president of Venezuela, fly through Amer U.S. airspace. Yeah, the U.S. is getting pretty nasty. What was that? Uh, a, year a year or two ago? Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was Austria, wasn't it? Yeah, it's interesting that the now Latin American governments are much more independent of the U.S. than the governments of Europe, which is not the world I grew up in. Oh. Yeah, like in Russia, they had the Soviets, and in Venezuela, they have the circles. So, like uh, indigenous uh, 
governing groups. Do they have anything like that in uh, <coughs> in Bolivia or Ecuador? Well, um, uh, since I was on a political tour in Bolivia, I went, I saw that more in Ecuador. I just I didn't get the impression that the people were organizing themselves so much, but definitely. Bolivia seems a lot like Venezuela, that the people are organizing about everything all the time. Even, I think, you know, the child workers are organizing. And that's one, you know, child labor, they demanded that the child labor laws, they reduced the late age of child labor to, I think, 10. This was not something. So Bolivia has the youngest the child labor laws apply, I don't know how to say it, but you can be a child worker when you're 10, as legal in Bolivia now. <laughs> and a lot of people say, well, see how bad it is there now, you know, they can exploit kids that are 10 years old. But actually it was the work, the children themselves who had demonstrations in La Paz to say that we want to be recognized as legal workers and we're going to be in our own union so we can have standards of labor apply to us. So the government said, okay, we'll do that. But uh, in Bolivia, they're organizing a lot. In Ecuador, I didn't see it that much. But I don't know what the names are. Stan, uh, <coughs> I, I remember that Bolivia was a country with two capitals, uh, La Paz and Sucre. Now, do we hear anything from Sucre? I think that was where the judicial uh, Supreme Court was in Sucre. Uh, but I think it was Sounds like that they, they were more One's more European yeah. oriented. Yeah, I guess I, yeah, I do remember they said they when they had their constitutional assembly in Bolivia, it, well, I think it met in a different city. I guess that was Sucre. Oh. So I guess that's the uh, the real <coughs> functional capital of was La Paz. Okay. okay. Um, so, David? Yes, my question is this, and I'm not sure you can, whether you can answer it or the gentleman back there who spoke up can. Okay. I had no idea that there was a Nicaraguan canal being even considered. I thought this kind of went out the, went out the window when we decided to build the Panama Canal instead. Um, so they're, re, they're revisiting this? Yeah, I think China's going to build one. Oh. Is that who, China? China. China is a bigger trader in Latin America now than the U.S. See, the one thing they want to do is stop the tolls that can be done by the United States with the uh, with the Panamanian Canal, even though it's been turned over. They want to introduce an element of competition to the Nicaraguan no, Canal. No, actually, that's not, not true. It's actually, they're not for competition. The present Panama Canal is too small. You can't take... Yeah, I think they're building a deeper same canal. Same with yeah. Suez. So this I mean, one's always been a project since the 1890s. Um, because you can use the Nicaraguan lake to make it to super tanker capability both ways. Can't so it's you? Not gonna, the amount that's being opened up by the Chinese, there's no competition, there's more than enough for everybody. We're acting like idiots in the United States, not being part of it, as we're bailing out Wall Street. I thought, though, that the canal itself, that they were expanding the Panamanian Canal to, to accommodate yeah, larger they're ships. They're doing that also. There's a Nicaraguan canal, the Suez Canal is being doubled, and the, um, you know, the Nicaraguan canal. Okay. This Thank is, you. This BRICS arrangement is opening up. All right. All right, Brahm, if there's well, no more I questions, let's get... I understand get... you've had a lot to swallow, but if that, if you're not going to ask any more questions, we'll have a rebuttal period, and uh, how many people here have... Let's give thank our speaker for it. At the end of the rebuttal period, he gets to rebut all your rebuttals. Let's thank him again, again. Come on, guys. How many people have remarks to make? One.
7:54 right now. We roughly got an hour. I would say we if let's get go with five minutes apiece, and then we'll and then if we need to do a second round or I have other people other things to say, I'm sure we'll do it because I'm sure we'll get more as we go. All right. I will give a one minute warning like this with 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 my hands before to let you know one minute's left. All right. Uh, the, remember if if Tim gives you. The finger. You got one minute left. <laughs> you got maybe one minute left to, to your remarks. We'll start with Andy Anderson. Going five. Andy. Tim. Yeah. Just make sure it's the polite finger. Oh, I will. <laughs> but you can watch me for a minute or two. I'm gonna go grab a. Andy is hungry, so I can keep a little track there. I can see my own timer. I'd like to thank our thank our speaker again. Uh, for those of you that came late, uh, my name is Andy Anderson, uh, and I'd like to thank the speaker for a really good presentation of beneficial things that you know are happening in other countries that we don't hear about at all in America. I was struck by, uh, you know, several times during his presentation, they're talking about uh, free education in some of these schools. They're talking about reversing uh, the concept of letting corporations suck 85% of the profits out of, you know, economic activity in the country. Uh, basically, these leaders in other countries are trying to take back their company countries from corporate domination. The reason, I think the reason that Americans, as he said several times, uh, you know, we have outrageous things happening in America that people don't protest. Well, it's be, because of the way our media functions, and I mentioned it earlier, I'll read this book into the record again, it's called, this is Censored 2015. This is Project Censored out of Sonoma State University in California. They are, it's a journalism project. Uh, they're linked to other journalism schools around the country. And they, the stories are fed to them uh, via the grapevine or whatever, things that were published somewhere. And they call it down to the top 25 most explosive stories that would change America overnight if the people were made aware of them, if they were covered rather than blacked out. So if you only buy one book a year, I would suggest getting this one from Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Barnes & Noble carries it, they just don't advertise it. $18. Online, uh, well, some of you may uh, buy it from any green outfit you want, but the important thing is get the book. This is Censor 2015? Censor 2015, uh, Censor News, Project Censor, uh, I've got cards with these websites on them, incidentally. See me afterwards. Project Censor has been up and running for 37 years. And so they, uh, they, they describe how the American people are maintained in a bubble of mythology on certain subjects. We believe things that uh, uh, the official story is not what happened. Let me have a show of hands here. Uh, how many people can identify the eight-year stretch in American history when that was when we had no president and no vice president. Does right. anybody know that? Sure, sure. When, <laughs> when was that? George Bush. January 2001, January 2009. Right. That stretch, we had no president and no vice president. We had two corporate criminals that lost both elections and were installed with massive corporate criminal activity. That's just one of the things. America, can you imagine what it was like for other world leaders to address George W. Bush as Mr. President? Um, it's mind-boggling. Uh, there's going to be uh, there'd be extensive literature given out uh, at least two times upcoming soon on uh, reality-based topics like this. If any of you are interested, the first one um, is going to be January 31st. 
uh, Ted uh, Arend, Arenda, Ted Aranda is giving an update on all the forensic evidence that's been published about the myth of 9-11 that was sold to us by the Hollywood-driven corporate media. So uh, the rest of the world is moving forward. Uh, they, they know that 9-11 was what is driving our military to protect oil fields all over the world. It's all one big myth that sold to 5% of the American people. On February 14th, I'll be giving a presentation on the exact mechanisms, how, how Americans come to believe mythology with a, a, a cult-like fervor, just like being in a, some kind of religious cult. And they are uh, immune to facts about what's happening in the real world until the evidence gets so big that you can't tolerate it anymore, uh, to suppress it. The last thing I'll leave you with is in you know, about 20 seconds. Do a Google search. Uh, for those of you that haven't seen it, you, uh, the difference between third world countries and us is something happened in Florida uh, that could not happen in Bolivia or Ecuador. A 90-year-old man uh, was arrested, was arrested for feeding the homeless people, setting up, uh, uh, and that, uh, there's a good YouTube video that shows that, how uh, Fort Lauderdale considers it now a crime. You can be arrested if you try to set up a table near a church or something and feed the homeless like they all, we always have. So uh, this is the emerging police state in America and we need to address it. Thank you. Who's next? An extra butter? Okay, go, go ahead. Well, if nobody's going to go, I'll start then myself. Who's who's next? Okay, Sid. Can I go next, Tim? Yeah. I, just, just. I'm sorry, Sid. Uh, I think what's happening in the world is people are becoming very conscious of the fact that capitalism doesn't work anymore. You have something like 856 people that control half the wealth of the planet. And then people in the United States are working for eight, nine dollars an hour, seven dollars an hour, and they could barely get by. And about 70% of the American people are way down on the bottom. They barely get by from week to week, month to month. They're just on the edge of poverty. And, and the intellectuals and some of the other people are realizing this is not a viable system. It's causing a global warming. If you look what's happening in Miami and southern Florida, we have the oceans rising. And they say southern Florida keeps going like it is. It'll be gone in about 30 years. So th there's just a, an extreme crisis that's going on where people are just getting fed up with their conditions and maybe some of them are getting their information from the internet. I know the Communist Party has uh, its information. They used to, I used to read Political Affairs, which was put out by the Communist Party, and I don't, I don't have an internet. I don't even know how to work it, so I don't have that type of information. But they're putting out on the internet about the uh, type of system that we have that's based on exploitation of labor. And the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. And the 1% which really control the country, that is not even 1%, I think it's about one hundredth of 1% really control the country. And all the wealth is going to them. While the Obama administration keeps saying they're producing jobs, 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 but the jobs don't pay anything. People can't live on those jobs. So that's why you have during the Christmas season, you have the people from Walmart and the other fast food places, the other places that produce this cheap clothing that's made in, in slave 
in, in nations that are basically waste slave nations, making hardly anything, and, and the capitalists are making more and more mark. This is not a viable system. And I think that's being shown what's happening in Latin America. It first started in Cuba, and now it's going to Venezuela and, and Colombia. Uh, Colombia. They're, they're trying to produce, a, a have talks in Havana to settle the war there, but like he said, in Ecuador, Bolivia, and even in Chile, things are beginning to change. So you can see the direction of society is moving towards socialism. Now it's going to be a long struggle, there's no doubt about it. But I think if we don't destroy ourselves like global warming or a nuclear war, I think it'll move towards socialism. Right. Right. Okay. Next. I have some very great comments to direct at you, Andy. <laughs> I said I have some very brief comments directed mainly at you. Okay. I have a lot of respect for a lot of things you say up here, Andy. If I had the time, I'd read all those books that you recommend. Um, but I think you're wrong on 9-11. I think the 9-11 conventional story is pretty much how it happened. No, it isn't. And you've always seen it. One fool out of time, please. One fool out of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just off the track. One fool out of time. Um... <laughs> uh, I would direct you to Counterpunch and Alexander Coburn's articles on 9-11 as well as Manuel Garcia's in which he proves the physics of how it could have happened conventionally. Uh, just the last thing I'd like to say about this is Alex Coburn claimed that it was a mark of racism to suppose that 19 Arabs in a cave couldn't pull off 9-11. All right. All right, next. All right, five minutes, go ahead. My name is Ron Bettig. I'm a, um, a political organizer. And when I was talking here about the BRICS, um, actually the world changed in uh, July when the <coughs> Russia, China, India, South America, South Africa, and Brazil met, and then all the Latin American countries met with it. What they set up was a banking system, credit system, and a new arrangement to protect various nations. So when Wall Street and London ganged up on Argentina, they had an option. Rather than capitulating, they had backup. So the whole shebang is shifting. And if you look from July to the present, what's happened in Egypt and the new, you know, the Suez Canal, you look what's developing in Bolivia, South Africa, Mexico is right now under all kinds of pressure to not build these railroads. He was, you know, pressured by Obama not even to go to Asia. We can go through a lot of details. We actually have a meeting at the library at um, Albany Park next uh, Saturday, the 6th, at uh, 1.30 to 4.30. But to speak to the, um, I think what I got from the speaker was, for the first time in a long time, somebody who actually has a connection to the population. You get so much arrogance in the United States tied to this British Wall Street kind of, you know, thug operation. And what's now on the table is an offer to the United States to join in parallel with this BRICS arrangement and build these kinds of operations. And whether you look in Latin America in these canals or whether you look in, uh, say, India, Modi, the new president of India, has an, you mentioned uh, an unemployment program. One million new jobs every month for the next 10 years. They want to literally take the entire country, build a sanitation program, build an electrification program. They're moving on an American system of credit, which is what the Chinese have fostered, modeled on the United States system. So you got literally now a global network that reflects almost half, if not 60% of the world's population going in this American system direction. The irony is, the United States is not part of it, not leading it, and, and as people have laid out here, not even aware that it's going on. As you got literally these nations around the world adopting LaRouche's policy, there's whole networks within the United States now moving in that direction. 
we've got to actually put through Glass-Steagall bankrupting this Wall Street uh, money operation, the derivatives, and make this order, order shift, and we can build out of this. So this meeting is next um, Saturday, December the 6th, Albany Park, 1.30 to 4.30, and you're all welcome. There's some leaflets here and things on it. But this is not little stuff. This is the American Revolution being picked up globally, and the United States has got to join this invitation. So I liked your speech. We've got a lot to build. And this is how we're going to fix the situation with the youth. Give them a mission. Give them a purpose. You know, Egypt put its entire population from 18 to 35 to work building this canal. And since August, they've got it half built already, at least dug out, not built. So thanks for your time. All right, I'll go. All right, I'll go next. You know, I have been wondering time and time again with the old socialist arguments because frankly I don't think socialism works. What we saw here tonight with Bolivia and, e and Ecuador was a spending of government money to benefit the population with a higher tax rate. And yes, we could do these same things in the United States if we wanted to. And I think at one point we used to. I honestly think that right now our problem in the United States is one of just fundamental math problems. You cannot spend your way out of a deficit out of a deficit without increasing taxes. You also have to pay for the size of government that you want. Yes, we have the wealth in this country to do as what they have said in Ecuador and everything else. And it's going to take an increase in taxes to pay for it, as well as our other financial obligations. What has happened before was that about 60 years ago, this whole model of, of socialism was also current in uh, a Latin America, and they modeled themselves on the old Soviet-style republic. Normally what happens is after one or two generations, you get what they call statist institutions. They don't innovate, they don't do anything, and they start stagnating because they don't allow trade. The best way to get people out of poverty around the world has already been proven, and it's called capitalism. It's been delivering the goods for well over 300 years. What we have today in a lot of places is what we call old, uh, old style uh, mercantilism, where the means of productions are owned by a few large corporations that there's not the element of competition that's been brought involved. And a lot of the a lot of the problems with Latin America are from a lot of the major American corporations manipulating their governments. A lot of the problems down there has been the simple fact that the poor can't get access to the courts or the rule of law or the property rights that they're entitled to. This has been proven time and time again by an agency in Peru called the Institute for Liberty and Democracy headed by Hernando de Soto. What China has done, you know, if you really like socialism, why don't you take go back to have to the days of Mao in China? He was promising a glorious socialistic revolutionary state. And when they went capitalist, almost a third of that country got out of poverty fast. The far fastest way to get out of poverty is to keep this capitalist revolution and globalization moving forward. What? That's absolutely correct, Charlie. You heard me. Keep the capitalistic revolution and globalization system going forward. And we also have to change and get our get ourselves off of fossil fuels. And I'm sorry, but renewables are simply not gonna cut it. Go nuclear. That's absolutely correct, Charlie. Go nuclear with Gen 4 reactors. I'm not going to say more because I'm sure I've already drawn out the, uh, has been well explained in past presentations. 
socialist country in the world. Every attempt at socialism has been fought tooth and nail by the capitalist countries. And they have been very successful to the present time, including Cuba and all of the states in Europe who had socialist tendencies. There are countries that are socialistic. They have some of the characteristics of socialism. But there are no countries in the world that are socialist. So, your position that socialism doesn't work, we don't know that. <laughs> Capitalism tried for about 1,500 years to emerge from mercantilism and uh, uh, other forms of barter. Uh, it, it was a long struggle. And 300 years ago, they began to succeed through the Industrial Revolution. Yep. And now, we have passed the Industrial Revolution. We passed it on to other countries. We passed it on to China and India, uh, Malaysia, Bangladesh, other countries which will handle capitalism or they may not. But capitalism has been successful so far. Socialism cannot exist in one country. It has to exist worldwide or it will not exist at all. Oh. <laughs> All right, Dave's up there. I'm glad to hear that Latin America is moving right, moving right along. And I'm sorry, I don't know that I agree either that um, capitalism is automatically and by default the way to go here. I don't know that socialism is either. The only thing that can be said in defense of capitalism speak is that microphone. I am. No, that, every, directly that everything else is so much worse. Um, Latin America seems to be moving right along here. I had thought that the Nicaraguan, Nicaraguan Canal had that um, that had kind of come to, and and the discussion of it kind of came to an end when we when we built the Panama Canal. In fact, the U.S. government went out of its way to point out that there were volcanoes on Nicaraguan postage stamps and that this would not be a sound route for the canal. And so it seems that the Nicaraguan canal is back. Um, thank you. Yeah. How are you guys doing? Uh, thanks a lot, Stan, for your talk. Um, I'd like to visit uh, those countries at some point. But real quick, um, we need to bring back the maximum wage. We used to have one. Republicans said, uh, would you sign a bill FDR with 94% income tax above a certain annual earnings, no matter how you earn the money? And he said, put it on my desk, I'll sign it. It was roughly... Uh, to say was 150,000 a year. If you take that forward, after 2.5 million, you know, we're going to just keep collect all that extra earnings. Those guys were not in soup lines, the rich. They weren't looking for handouts. They didn't leave the country. They were fine. They still had their silver. They had one vacation home, not 10. They had two cars, not four. They weren't doing okay, the rich. It's time to bring back the maximum uh, revenue in this country. Everything above that is taxed. It would help. And the next thing is, it took a little piece of Sahara Desert, a tiny square, you couldn't even see it, because Western Europe, you know, is pretty small. On a normal map, you can't see Western Europe, because it's tiny. And this little square was how much sun mirrors you would need lined up together to power Western Europe. Then it showed the U.S. The square was barely visible. Then it showed 
consecutive square acreage of Sahara Desert where no one lives to power the world. With, of course, the sun is renewable. So it's total fiction. We can't do that. Um, you know, we don't need to really drill for carbon anymore. I mean, there's a few planes I heard that are already flying. Jets are flying based on, I think it's a hemp type of uh, fuel. So there's a way to do it. Um, it's just Rockefeller is the most evil man we ever had in this country. I'll leave you with this. I don't want educated people growing up in my country. I just want a nation of workers. He funded federal education because he saw that some teacher like this guy in Kansas would break through and they find a way to not need his messy black liquid anymore. He pushed for national education to dumb us down. It's 100, 110 years ago his wet dreams come true. Uh, <laughs> but it was done by one greedy billionaire, Mr. Rockefeller, unlike the other one in Europe, the Rothschild, who's worth 5,000 times what Gates is worth. Funded every war since Napoleon. So we can do renewables, and we need to really go back to a school system where it's still union, but it's completely uh, egalitarian and no longer centralized, because obviously we're all been made really dumb. It was all based on Rockefeller. Thank you. I wonder, you know, the Pharaoh's system existed uh, for uh, hundreds, thousands of years, and they existed. It worked. They built lots of pyramids and tombs, and, and, and people had work, and people starved. And people escaped uh, from slavery uh, in Egypt. They built uh, new lands in, the, in the, what is now called the Holy Land, or uh, Palestine, or Israel, or Palestine slash Israel. Uh, well, and it all works. People work. If people don't work, they don't live, they don't eat. Uh, so, it works, but people also starve. And people are miserable. And capitalism has known a lot of starvation and a lot of misery and wars. And, you know, so, Two years <coughs> for capitalism produces a lot, but you know you can do it better, and that's what people try to do, and they call it socialism. They do it all sorts of different ways, and they call them their socialisms and socialisms. And the socialists fight one another a whole lot, and disagree with each other a whole lot, and sometimes they shoot each other a whole lot. And that's, yeah, yeah. People with their isms, people have ideas of how, how things should be, and who is right, and who is wrong, and who is indigenous, and who doesn't really belong? Well, indigenousness can be a good mark or a bad mark, depending on who is in power. Uh, and when it comes to the system that is in the United States, it's up to people in the United States who have to live in that system to figure out what can be done to save people from oppression and exploitation and make the system respectful to, of the rights of everybody. 
Now, in making it respectful, I mean, I want to be respectful to everybody, but sometimes it gets a little hard. Uh, not everybody wants to be respectful of me. No, I'm sorry. Uh, and one thing about the College of Complexes is that we try to be respectful. Oh yeah. People's right. <laughs> sometimes. Yeah, I respect And all sometimes these people. people like Charlie here uh, are, no are a little touch. bit of a fly in the ointment and uh, a little heckling occurs. Okay. But so far it's been pretty good and I think if we're is yeah, there somebody yeah. else who needs yeah. to speak? A uh, Charlie. Yeah, yeah. All right. All right. After Charlie, yeah. we might hear from Samuel Smith. This is your change. All right. I don't really have much to say. I just want to thank my neighbor from Bridgeport, Sam, for giving us another tour right, right. and insight into countries we normally don't look at. Um, I generally depend on. My association with the, I've been in the United Nations Association for a good many years and served as an officer of the chapters here and things. Um, it's 193 countries right now uh, comprise the geography of the world and it's a little hard to keep up with what's going on in each of them. Uh, this, and I appreciate Stanley, you're keeping us abreast of certain countries. It's good to have some positive news. Uh, I'm going to be speaking a little bit in the future, and the information that I uncovered was just the opposite, not positive at all. I think there seems to be some consensus, with the exception of Tim, that the multinational corporations and their uh, practices of extraction and exploitation, uh, you know, have not brought, improved the lives of the people of the countries where they've made an appearance. Uh, the multinational corporation, I actually, I don't think goes back that far. I recollect in, in grad school, we actually had to research it and it probably only I think you could challenge this, but it only came about around the, the mid-70s that the uh, commercial people, I mean, there's certainly the presence overseas of corporations, Shell Oil, and things of that nature. But it seemed to be, I guess they call it a business plan or something like that, that if you have some presence overseas, you can make a lot of money real quick, easily, and cheaply. Uh, we're going to have some talks in here in February on this United vote uh, and the def definitions of corporations. You know, I almost think that they really don't care about the United States now because they kind of, these multi corporations operate with such impunity that they really are more powerful. This is why I like the United Nations. I think it's the only, personally, I think it's the only check that we have uh, against this, these entities, these corporations. Uh, when they can come in and take over countries with relative ease, including the United States, I don't, I'm not certain what, what defensive or offensive things you can do about it. Uh, yeah, it's courageous that certain countries have, <coughs> and we certainly applaud that, and hope to see, I don't think I have to tell anybody except for Tim, you know. Okay. Now, Tim, you said that things were so terrible under Chairman Mao in China, and things were so wonderful with capitalist China, you mean under the Republic? I, I don't think things were so wonderful then. <laughs> Charlie, <laughs> and that wasn't exactly the place 
Yeah. And then everybody would want to live. You got one minute, Charlie. Charlie, one minute. One minute, Charlie. One minute. All right, that's all I got. I can't kick at him for all another minute. But anyhow, thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, we are, I enjoy these travel log things. I think they're very good, very informative, and uh, mm -hmm. we'll try to get some more on the schedule. Thank you very much. Yeah. Look at I gave a whole minute away. <laughs> All right. Right. Mike. Go ahead, Mike. Get up there. Yeah, we'll give you a break. We'll give you a break. You get up there and speak. Go ahead. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. We're giving you naughty boy. Yeah, you are. We're giving you five minutes. We're trying to redeem you, good sir. Get up there. Get up there and redeem yourself. Go ahead, we're giving you the microphone. You don't know what you're asking for. We know what we're asking for. Go ahead. I'm the one that don't know what's going on. Redeem yourself. You got five minutes. Mr. Smith gave a very interesting talk. He made a comment, he actually said it twice during his lecture. I wondered if somebody was throwing me bait. I really did. On two occasions he said that the United States of America is the richest country in the world. The last guy that stood at this podium and said that was lying, just like Mr. Smith is wrong. The last guy called him a liar. The last guy was smart enough to know that the United States is not the richest country in the world. He was some kind of lawyer, politician, big shot with all the financial numbers and everything. Anyway, I called the guy a liar because he was a liar. And I've been in detention ever since. <laughs> that was about three months ago. Now, Mr. Smith said that this country is the richest country in the world, and that's a flat-out flavoring that can lie. I'm not calling Mr. Smith a liar, not because I learned my lesson, but because, not because I'm, anyway, maybe Mr. Smith don't realize that when you're $17 trillion in debt, you're not rich. So, Mr. Smith, I won't call you a liar. Maybe I'll be charitable and call you uninformed. Oh, that's nice. But... If you really think a country at seventeen trillion dollars in the hole is a rich country, if you really believe that, you're stupid. Okay. All right. Well, we got an open mic. We still have some time. We're open for a second round of rebuttals. Oh. Okay, Andy, go ahead. You can get another another five if nobody else talks. Oh yeah, I'll say something about 9-11 to Tracy too. <laughs> okay. When you're ready, Andy, I'm all set. Right. Uh, one of the phenomenon we see here at the college, and I hope this is being filmed and whoever is watching this will uh, get to this portion of it, because we're going to try to talk about this on February 14th. In a group, uh, some people already gone home, but in a normal college, you have people that are incredibly informed, are, uh, they almost have encyclopedic knowledge on one or two or three subjects that they've been studying their whole lives, while at the same time, they're incredibly uninformed living in a bubble of ignorance and mythology on something else that is commonplace knowledge to a person over here that's been studying that for his whole life. And so um, one of the reasons that my brother and I collect and translate books is to help people that don't have time to read 50 books on a subject, say. Give a person a wheelbarrow. Here's 50 books. you got five minutes. What's in there? Well, there's no time. If uh, We used to count on the media to uh, research something for six months and then put a 30 or 60 second blurb on television or, or an article in the newspapers or something. Investigative journalists used to do that. But now investigative journalists can get fired, blackballed, or killed, or their families being killed if they try to talk about or write about certain stories in America. Uh, there's a movie out right now about the reporter from the San Jose Mercury, Gary Webb, that wrote about uh, the CIA's drug running operation with Oliver North and a bunch of other people that were indicted 
and then a bush appointed judge has said, oh, case closed, I'm going fishing, or case dismissed. And we, our police are being militarized, coming out of the myth that was sold to us on the morning of September 11th. They're, they're among the scientific communities, investigators worldwide, there's no longer any, any scientific disagreement at all about what happened on 9-11. The debate has shifted. The debate now is which countries are going to be first to start hunting down, tracking down, and arresting the criminals that did it because they know it wasn't. Osama bin Laden and his people, 19 crazed Muslims, had nothing to do with the destruction of all seven buildings and the old office complex in New York that was slated for demolition since 1989. The demolition of the World Trade Center uh, with all the buildings prepped with a really good, uh, by demolition experts, uh, they were prepared months in advance. The thing was planned years in advance. If you look at an aerial photo, all seven buildings of the World Trade Center were demolished. The two twin towers were dustified, and the buildings across the street, within 50 feet or so, none of those buildings were really damaged. It was a really superbly done demolition where it was sold to us as a terrorist event so that the people that demolished it couldn't be sued for sowing, spreading asbestos dust all over lower Manhattan. Once you understand that they sold that demolition of old buildings to us as a terrorist event to create a new Pearl Harbor, your worldview shifts on where we are. So uh, the myth of 9-11 uh, and the militarization of uh, the American police forces, the Patriot Act, it all goes hand in glove with the idea that we have to beef up our military, beef up our police departments, and there's no money left over for all the social programs that we heard that are being done in other countries that aren't pouring their money down a military rat hole. Um, so, yeah, as I said, uh, I'm always, um, is, uh, in, in response to Mike Foley's comment, I've been wrestling this for years. When somebody stands up on any subject or you're having a debate and somebody tells you the earth is flat, trust me. Well, is he lying to you or is he terrifyingly ignorant of the basic facts or is he an intellectual prostitute that's paid by some rich entity to lie to you about something? And so you know, a lot of the information we get, people are very sincere. Uh, I'll bring articles uh, September uh, when I come here February uh, 14th. I'll get some reprints of an article from 2007. A man named Phil Rockstro wrote an article called A Disneyland of Militant <coughs> Ignorance. We live in America. America is a Disneyland of militant ignorance. People are incredibly ignorant about basic facts and they're militant, militantly ignorant to the point where they will attack you or come up afterwards and say, oh, you're full of hogwash and everything else, rather than say, I didn't know about those facts. Maybe I should look at it before I disgrace myself in public again. So uh, anybody that's interested in learning how we come to believe in mythology and what we can do to help otherwise learned people sort through that particular piece of mythology they have, come uh, February 14th. Thank you. Yeah, now, some things that our government has told us. Our government told us that Osama bin Laden was the mastermind behind 9-11, or the head stud dude behind 9-11, or whatever phrase they used, our government told us that Osama bin Laden was in charge of the whole show on 9-11. Our government also told us that Osama bin Laden was an employee of the United States government. He was an employee of the Central Intelligence Agency. That means that our government told us that 9-11 was an inside job. Our government told us that the head stud dude in charge of 9-11 was an employee of the United States government. Now, our government also told us that there was a falling out between our government and Osama bin Laden back in the 90s or something like that. That was a flat out lie. And I'll tell you why it was a lie. Go back to Diem and his brother. They're both dead and they're still dead and they're going to stay dead. They were allies of the United States of America. 
and John Kennedy got pissed off at him for some reason or other. President of the United States, John Kennedy, had the two of them murdered by the Central Intelligence Agency, and they were supposedly allies of the United States of America because there was some kind of falling out between Diem and his brother and President Kennedy. That's what happens to people when there's a falling out between the CIA, the President of the United States, the American Empire. The guy is dead the next day. We're supposed to believe that Osama bin Laden had some kind of falling out with the United States government, but he didn't get killed. The fact that he didn't get killed means there was no falling out between him and the United States government. And on September 11, 2001, Osama bin Laden was an employee of the government of the United States of America. He worked for the Central Intelligence Agency. He probably might have been an employee in one, in one of Charlie's unions. He might have been a member of one of the government unions. Me out of this. He had, he had health care. He had paid vacation. He had pension plan. He had paid holidays, paid sick days, paid personal days, paid work at home days, just like any other employee of the United States government. And he was an employee of the United States government. And our government told us he's the one that brought down the towers in, in New York. Our government said that 9-11 was an inside job. So, Tracy, you're full of shit, too. <laughs> well, we, got, we, got, we got some time, don't all worry. Right, all right, all uh, right. Let's, uh, well, we're not going to revisit 9-11 officially until when? Uh, is that February, January? I've looked into this topic. I, it, how can I use the expression, I have a union associate, he, he says, I have no dog in this fight. And I really don't, but I have, we've had the 9-11 truth, the academic guys here from Madison, Wisconsin, and a number of other people, and only recently did I really look into it. Um, the thing that disturbs me about it is the overall thing, if you prepare cases, you, you have a theory of the case, you know this kind of stuff, Mr. Lawyer over here. Uh, but they don't have any conspirators who actually participated. And I find that a little questionable. There's a lot of theories out there. But they don't have anybody to actually testify that I participated and, as, and did this. Now you think you'd find at least somebody out there over a period of 10 years. And then we're stacking theory upon theory upon theory, and we have more theories to protect the theories, and there's something in science where you gotta stop doing that. And it's like Oakham's Racer. You've got the simplest explanation is, in fact, the thing. Now, the thing I was, some of the things I came across was, oh, there's this explosive paint that was used. This one I found rather intriguing. And they said it was thermite or nanothermite, which sounds like it's rather, you know, they developed some sort of, this is nothing but the things that is used by children that play with sparklers. And I said, how in the world do you bring down a 110-story building using sparklers, but apparently some people think you can do so. Uh, there's been some things, it's problematic, it's not an explosive, and it doesn't work that way. <laughs> now, the most amazing thing is, I've heard it again a few minutes ago, that these buildings, there was something unique about them, and that there was dustification, which sounds like it was something new and didn't happen previously. However, anybody who studied the bombing in World War II was that there, in fact, was dustification of many portions of the countries of Europe through conventional bombing. There was very much identical using conventional explosives in the, in the buildings of, of Europe during conventional bombing. There was nothing exactly the piles of rubble that they found. Now, the other one is this book that's come out most recently about a woman, and she says cars were toasted. Well, yeah, there was falling debris and fire. It spread over quite an area. I'm from New York and, and, and a little familiar with it, and I said, yeah, this, this 
fire spread over and destroyed any number of buildings and unquestionably would get vehicles on the street. But she wrote an entire book apparently based on, she began by looking at pictures. And I go, well, this is a real investigative approach. We look at pictures. Um, we don't want anything too deep or sophisticated, but we'll look at pictures. And then she says, I think at one point, and I could stand corrected, she said that cars were toasted even half a mile away or something. But she didn't do her research well enough because those cars were in fact, had been burned, but they were moved by the city of New York to get them out of the way. And that was not the perimeter of the fire, which kind of, I got to wonder about the rest of her, her data and things of this nature. Now some other things that come out here that people are taking off planes and put in witness protection programs and things of this nature. Uh, you know, I, I don't know what road we're going down on this. But the burden of proof, where does the burden of proof lie? On the people who are disclaiming it. And you haven't really gotten your case together yet. And I don't know when you're going to. Why is it taking so long? Why can you not find people who come forward and tell straightforward I, would, I participated in this. You should have no problem with this. It would require multiple people. Just, uh, I just can't proceed. This is a big time operation. This is not a small scale little thing. Bringing down big buildings is not done by a handful of people. And why? The question I ask, and this that's the same. The other thing is this rebut. They, the, there's so much confusion among even the 9-11 truthers, they're rebutting each other that you get lost. And what the fuck are they doing? Say, <laughs> Charles, the normal procedures have the, the guests have a last thing to say. All right, we got time. Okay. Well, yeah, let's... So one thing uh, on your saying, everything that was discussed doesn't get to why it was done. And so people should concern more of themselves. You can come up here. Come on up and explain. Yeah, come on. Come on. Why? Come on. How? You got five minutes. Who? When? Where? You will focus on one? Who? Don't give the 15 minutes. Okay. Uh. How? The, when? Where? There are 28 pages in the original investigation led by Senator Robert Graham and others. <laughs> that have been put under wraps first by Bush and still now classified by the Obama administration, although there's been a massive push to declassify that. <coughs> the section just prior to those 28 pages discusses that they're now moving into who logistically financed the operation, especially the operation internal to the United States. And those 28 pages corroborating other evidence that's existed in in Florida, New Jersey, you name it, point to the fact of this Saudi Arabian British BAE uh, <laughs> slush fund that actually has financed this. And this is actually documented down to paychecks to some of them. There, in fact, who's coming forward? There is a guy presently on the trial um, that's actually laying out that he was involved with Ambassador uh, Bondar from Saudi Arabia met with a number of the hijackers and this thing <laughs> should be brought public. So people can think in any way they want. There are That's a traditional story. All right, but there's 28 pages that these congressmen, many of them now have been forced to read it, we can force it public. Force it public and we'll open up a lot of these things. Don't get caught up in what happened to this building, what happened. Figure out who did it for what reason. That's what's in the 28 pages. Let's get them public. So you're, you're verifying the traditional... Verifying what? The traditional story. What I'm saying, if you look at the financial crash we're in, like in Germany in 1920, blocking right now, 23, what you have with the, the blowout, it wasn't in 23 that you actually had the Reichstag fire operation run, but they gave Hitler the power. Yes, you know, it was 33, yeah. So what you have is a situation, 9-11 is run as that kind of an operation to get the kind of police state shift we're now in. So it was an orange revolution on the United States. 
So let's face that and actually come to our senses and go the other direction. Start with forcing these things public. 28 pages. Check out a couple of books by um, well, Senator Graham. Aren't these oh. public? Or, no, they're classified. There's no, other... they're not. They don't exist. What? If you haven't got the info, come on, the burden's uh, on you. I can't okay. read... Yeah, the burden is on the uh, citizens of the United pages. States to get get up. You talk uh, about right. 28 pages that are blank. I right. agree with that statement. Right. Come on. Tim Bolter. Did you guys Again. see what is on the plaque of Benedict Arnold's London residence? It said he was a true American patriot. <laughs> and that he had the best interests of the United States at heart when he defected because he did not believe in the great divorce of America and Great Britain. And I'll tell you something, perhaps maybe Benedict Arnold was a great American patriot. And maybe we should have a congressional investigation as to why Benedict Arnold should be pardoned for his offense against the United States. After all, after all the plaque in London was done by a few of his family members who believes that he was a great American patriot. And that perhaps maybe the whole problem with Benedict Arnold was a smear campaign with Washington saying he needed to do it to get, that, to get a strategic victory with the Hessians against the Hessians and the British Army in order to make America and give him a reason for war. Who knows? Maybe Benedict Arnold was a great American patriot and maybe he was a dupe of the United States at that time. We don't know, but we better investigate. Shadow oh, well, Speaker Rebell. Yeah, Speaker Rebell. I just want to know how can I refute? How can I refute 28 blank pages? I'll give you. You gotta produce evidence. And that is. Not blanks. What does it prove if? Bolivia makes an increase in its industrial output of 6.5% in one year. Well, the question is, what is its industrial output? And as Stanfield Smith has told us, you know, they are not as industrialized as the great state of Ecuador, which uh, produces a lot of oil, but uh, I, you know, they they produce tin and copper in uh, in Bolivia, uh, not so much silver and gold anymore, uh, but uh, the uh, they. They will produce a lot of oil, uh, and uh, they will sell it abroad, and uh, it will be a, 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 a fortunately, uh, probably the backbone of their economy. I say unfortunately because that tends to be centrally allocated, and central allocation is uh, whether it's by a government or a corporation uh, tends to be held and distributed uh, by a limited number of people with a limited uh, perspective of, of what is good uh, for uh, investment. Uh, so uh, when, when it comes to a 6.5%, I remember when, well, I wasn't even alive then. Yes, I was alive in 1936. In the 30s, the Japanese took over Manchuria, and they doubled the health care. Uh, you know, you have nothing, and you double it, and you've got two, not, twice nothing, you know? Uh, yeah, <laughs> when you're underindustrialized and you, you begin to 
get a little industrialized, it's a very high growth rate. So, um, so there, there are statistics and statistics, and some of them prove just about nothing. All right. All right. So that's Yay. Ilker, yeah. Words here. Nobody's around. All right. Good job. Yeah, most of our audience departed. That was good. But the faithful few